say we import our entire database, you know, it's like 200,000 records or whatever, and can we geolocate all of those records that we import, or is that just great? There's a, there's a limit to the number of records you can bring into the workbench at one time. We obviously have to work to the lowest common denominator of people who have fairly slow machines with very little memory. Um, and the last thing that we want is for the workbench to continually crash people's machines because it's, it, it is a memory mark. It uses a lot of memory to be able to crunch all that data and get it into the database. So we have set that at 4,000 records. So you can only bring in 4,000 records at a time. There is a way that you can fudge that. You can go and increase it. There's a secret prep that you can go and play around with and change it to 10,000 or 20,000 if you have a very quick machine that has a lot of memory. Um, and so, but the nice thing is that what you can do is we have a, a little application that ships with specify called the import file center. And so you can take a 200,000 row Excel spreadsheet and you can run it through the file splitter and it will automatically chunk it up into 10,000 row segments. And then you can bring each one of those into the workbench one at a time. You can reuse the mapping that you create for the first one to all the subsequent ones so that you can just remap them and dump them all in. And then you just upload them one at a time. Upload them in. Um, so you would, need to, you would need to interact with the geolocate engine in each of those data sets. So you'd have to do it in 10,000 row chunks. Um, but there's a way that you can do it within Specify. Once you've got it into Specify, you can interact with the geolocate engine on the batch mode as well. So you could potentially go through your collection and do a query where lat and long is empty, meaning anything that isn't georeferenced. Create a record set of that, which is much like an Amazon shopping cart that you can play around with, and then you can drag and drop that onto the geolocate engine and you can send all of those ungeo-referenced localities to the georeferencing engine and go through the point of the count to step through them again. So hopefully we're going to get them all done for you during the fishing process. <laughs> Mark? Uh, just curious about, so, when it is, do you have examples of institutions <coughs> where two different collections, entomology and fishes, are both using specify, and do they use it separately, or do they use it integrated? There are, there are both instances. Okay. Um, we here at, at, at KU decided very early on to go with completely separate databases. Um, and there's a number of, this this a number of pros and cons to both scenarios. Um, the one is that if you if you have multiple collections all working in a single database, they share lots of pieces of information. Mm -hmm. So localities are shared within a right. discipline. And so you may have somebody in the mammal division going into a locality and changing it, and then it changes it for all the records that are associated with the bird collection. And so, you know, some collection managers go, ah, and other collection managers go, cool, he's correcting it. Right. And so that's one of the scenarios. The other scenario is that if all of your collections are in a single database and you back up that database, you're backing it up for everybody. So if somebody wants to go back three weeks in time, everybody has to go back three weeks in time. I see that as a bogus reason to not put things into a single database because here at KU we've had very few occasions where people have had to go back in time because they found a, a major error in the database. I just want to, you know, as institutions, Within institutions, we try and integrate databases across collections. Uh, might specify be a, a good way to do that. Where you know, in other words, I still keep my FileMaker database, but institutionally, we have one specified database that we push our data to 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 have that. Because I'd I'd love to have a database where I could search for the mammal locality records mm -hmm. and compare them to mine. Yeah, and that's you know that's the benefit of having of having all of your databases, all of your collections in one database, is that you can then give you know, guest privileges to you as the fish collection manager <coughs> to all the other collections, which means that you can go and search and see where mammals were collected at the same sites as your fish were collected. Right. You know, you have a collector who collected herbs and fish at the same place, and you just want to go and scavenge their record and put it in your database because it's much easier to do that. So there are definite, definite benefits to putting multiple collections, especially if there's a lot of shared information across those collections putting them all into one database. Um, but there are cons as well. So it, it, it's very much on an institutional level you have to decide whether it's, whether it's going to work for you or not. Well, I, is there a con to using it as the, the, ag, the institutional aggregator? What's, what's the con to that, to having? Well, there's always cons to keeping two different versions of your database running, cons running consecutively. You know, there's always cases where you're going to have things that are not consistent in both databases. Um, but the workbench could facilitate that. Really. Yeah, right. So, I mean, 
you yeah. can get your stuff out of file maker into an Excel, Excel spreadsheet and then take that Excel spreadsheet right. and dump it into the database. Yeah. I mean, the, that's the only kind I see there is just a, a lag time mm -hmm. for, for yeah. updates, which. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what are the what are the advantages of serving the data on the web through specify as opposed to our using one of these existing data aggregators and just sending it up to the, there are there are because your data is being served up as Darwin core, there are limitations to what fields you can actually serve up through one of the aggregators. So this just gives you some more flexibility in terms of deciding which fields people can search on, which fields are actually viewed. Um, at the moment, there's no way of displaying images in any of these aggregators, um, or no way of mapping any of them on a map, um, in some cases. Um, so it just affords you some more flexibility in terms of coming up with a, a sort of institutionally branded web page where people can go and search your collection. You've also got, the, you know, if you're going into GBIF and searching, it's, it's sometimes can be cumbersome to actually narrow that down to just one collection that you want to search. You're actually searching, you know, 150 million specimens, uh, whereas you may just want to be searching one collection at a time. If I could, I, if I could add to that, uh, having your own uh, web-based portal is good for people looking through your collections for loan purposes to see what it is you can talk, yeah. uh, rather than going through GBIF. Also, at least with GBIF, there's quite a bit of a lag time um, for yeah. harvesting an update. So you're going to wait six, eight, ten weeks, and if you find a pretty significant error, yeah. that error isn't going to be resolved in GBIF very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
but there's no reason why you couldn't do that at another institution as well. Um, it's basically just taking, much like the GBIF IPT cache, it's just taking the cache of your data and then dropping it into a web server instance. So there's no reason why if somebody else already had one set up and read them, running and had the IT start to, to support it, if you can drop your instance in there and have a separate instance running for you. Maybe a tricky question, but um, for those of us considering moving towards specify, are there any contingency plans just in case of um, any future lack of NSF funding? Is there some? Well, the biggest to... the biggest contingency plan is that it's open source. So even if we were to go away tomorrow, the community could take the project forward. There's enough, you know, intelligent and and, and uh, savvy people out there who could continue to work on the code and can, you know, can, could continue to move forward. Um, you know, we're hoping that that's not going to happen. Uh, we, we find it very difficult to, to see that NSF is going to drop us like a hot potato as soon as we have 450 collections using it all around the world. Um, you know, it's one of the most ubiquitously used collection management systems out there. Um, we find it very difficult to believe that they would, that they would drop us. And the signs, the signs are positive. They've just developed a new um, funding one at NSF specifically for bioinformatics products like this. Um, there was a bit of political wrangling that was going on in NSF some time back where they were trying to divest themselves of these long-term projects that were sucking up money. Um, but now that there's new uh, funding lines specifically for this kind of thing, um, things are looking a little more positive. Right. What's the time frame for release of the web browser to specify as a security or not to pay something to read and read? Uh, it's coming out with the next release. Perfect. Yeah. So it'll be out, it'll be out hopefully towards the end of, end of March. We've still got some testing to do and some playing around to make sure that everything's working. Um, but it should be it should be released towards the end. Will your team quite talk with you to make that a reality work? That they have to do, they have to do. We'll we'll be releasing documentation for it as soon as as soon as the new release is released and then you'll be able to go and set it up yourself. Um, you know, I'm playing around with the documentation as we speak. Um, trying to set it up for myself to see if the documentation works. And it seems like a relatively easy process. So it should be it should be good to go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm working with the Herbarium and they're using Bernard's database. Mm -hmm. They are having trouble with that database. I was wondering if there is a way they can store that that data they have from Bernard's to specify or if they have to enter it manually or how they use you know, There's a couple of ways that they could go about it. One is um, they could send us the bronze database and we can convert it for them. That is one of the services that we provide. Um, the, the biggest problem there is that there's, there's a waiting list of people trying to get into this um, Hopefully that waiting list is going to be severely reduced very shortly. We've just been given funding to, to hire a conversion specialist who's going to just do conversions for us. Because one of the problems we have at the moment is we have limited staff who are trying to handle all of these things. And at the moment we have developers doing conversions so not being able to spend as much time developing because they have to do the conversions. Um, so we're going to be hiring a dedicated conversion person to do 